Mary, maybe it was someone else. I think I'm mad. Peter! See the turn for yourself! Now, do you believe me? But he's gone. Gone? Now. He's back. I need a cup and some more wine. What happened? His body. His blood. I am the way. The truth. And the lie. Christ, 
they had work to do, as, as Peter said in this film clip. And they went off into the world, changed and transformed by the resurrection. How does the resurrection change you? What, how does it impact your life? Where are you different because you believe that Jesus is no longer contained in the tomb, but has risen and been victorious over death? I believe the resurrection has a few messages to give to us and encouragements that will help us in our walk of life, in our day and age. The first message is that we're not to be afraid. The angel came, and the first message that he gave was, don't be afraid to the women who, as they were approaching, saw and felt the earthquake and the angel descending out of heaven and coming down, sitting on top of the snow. The guards faded dead away. But these women, these strong women, who could bear children, did not faint. They were mesmerized. They were focused. They were so encouraged by what they were seeing, perhaps very frightened as well. The angel, probably taking from the manual of what do you do when you confront humans, said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The crucifixion was very fresh upon the minds of the women as they approached the tomb. And while, Mark, while Matthew gives us two women, the two Marys, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, he says, although we, we have her name from other scriptures, her name was Mary, the mother of James. We also have from the other gospel accounts that there was a group of women who were returning to the tomb. They were carrying spices and ointments and wrappings and things to finish the job that had been started on Friday because it was hurried and, and it was almost the Sabbath when the sun was setting and so Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus perhaps didn't finish the job and so the women wanted to go back and respect for their master, their teacher, to finish the preparations for the body, to rest in the grave. I think their faith and their, their love for him precluded the fact that there was this two-ton stone that was in front of the, uh, the entrance to the tomb, and there was a Roman guard there and a seal to make sure that nobody entered into it. But they went instead in faith. And they felt the earthquake, and they saw the angel, and they saw the stone rolled away, and they saw, saw this angel who appeared like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. What a fearsome account, an event that took place at that time. And these women got to witness that. Now it's interesting to me that the angel of the Lord was not sent to let Jesus out of the tomb. When you think about it, he's already gone out of the tomb. The angel rolled the stone away so that human beings could look inside and see that Jesus wasn't there. And I also like the fact that the earth shook in this account because this is a cosmic event. This is God working his most important miracle of all, the rising of Christ from the dead, the accomplishment of the forgiveness of sins, the victory over death. Where, O oh death, is I sting? Where, O oh death, is I victory? Jesus conquered it. And here, there was a rift in the cosmos. All of creation was shaken by this event that took place. And of course, the same word is used of the guards who were guarding the tomb. They were shaken to the point of fear and death, and they became uh, faint and came down like dead men, it says here. Some people will react to the resurrection with fear and trembling, and they'll deny it, and they'll They'll try to uh, remain in their deadness. But others will want to take another look, and others will be drawn to it. Those of us in the church are drawn by God, drawn by His messengers to receive the good news. We're to not be afraid. And I think that not be afraid phrase there is, is something more than just not being afraid of the event 
but not being afraid of what lies in the future, what lies in our past, what lies in our present right now. The sins that we struggle with, with the sins that we have committed, the, the death that is all around us, the oppression, the depression, all of our bad habits. The angels say, don't be afraid to come to the tomb. Don't be afraid to visit the miracle of God in Christ rising. Don't be afraid to come and investigate for yourself. And that leads me to the second impact the resurrection makes upon our lives. Is the angel invites us to take a look. He invited the women to see for themselves. He said, I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Yeah, he was crucified. Let me underline that. He was dead. He is not here, he said, for he has been raised, as he said. Again, a reminder that Jesus had predicted his death and his resurrection. And so the angel is giving him that reminder. And then he said, come see the place where he lay. Come take a look yourself. Look inside the tomb. See that his body is not here. And of course, the Gospel of John reports that as they looked in the tomb, there were grave wrappings, uh, grave cloths that were on the slab where they had laid the body, but there was no body there. So the women must have been thinking, could this be true? Is he truly alive? The only way to find out is to take a look. I believe that the angel is inviting all who, uh, who are around, uh, to, all of us, to look inside the tomb, to investigate for ourselves. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Can we find a body of Jesus anywhere in this world? Words of the angels speak directly to our fears. Fears that maybe if we did look, we might find an explanation that he really is dead. Fear that maybe his body is in a tomb that is yet to be discovered and will be discovered and all this will be blown up into myth. But the angel is saying, don't park your intellect, don't park your reason. Investigate for yourself and you will find that the tomb is empty. Now, over the years, many people have tried to disprove the resurrection and to discount it as myth. People like Josh McDonald, who wrote the book Evidence That Demands Avert Averted, or Lee Strobel, the journalist who wrote The Case for the Resurrection, or Frank Morrison, the lawyer who wrote Who Moved the Stone? These three books I commend to your reading to investigate, to take a look for yourself in the tomb and find that there's overwhelming evidence for the resurrection and very little evidence for it being a myth. Why would these people, whom Jesus called to be his disciples, suddenly put risk and, and safety at bay and run out into Jerusalem and proclaim Jesus as Lord, at risk of their death? Why would they go into to become martyrs throughout the world and sharing the good news if it wasn't true? As we look at the accounts of the resurrection, we see different uh, viewpoints and perspectives. We see details about things that are not necessarily uh, necessary for the story to be shared. And if these stories were um, made up and fabricated, they would all be the same. But we see different accounts. We see different details. We see humanness involved in these things. These are people who really believed, without a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus did not stay in the tomb, but was resurrected. He came back. The third impact that the resurrection has upon us is the imperative to go and to tell, to go and tell others the good news that Jesus is alive. News like this really can't be withheld. As we saw, if you read on, you'll see the disciples eagerly wanted to tell it to everyone that they came into contact with. The angels said, go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. So the imperative directs the women to leave the empty tomb and announce to the disciples that Jesus is indeed risen. Now it would be human nature to linger 
to want to stay in this moment. There's an angel, and his clothes are white as snow, and he's like lightning, and he's rolling stones away, and there's earthquakes. Hey, that's a great place to hang out. Let's see what other things that God is going to do. But the angel says, hey, don't linger here. Don't, don't just stay here at the tomb where the dead people are. Go tell the disciples, those who are still weeping and in grief, they need to be delivered from that and receive the good news that Jesus is alive. So the women are the first who are privileged to be the first preachers to share that good news. They're the first missionaries to go and to tell of Christ and His resurrection. You and I, after hearing and believing the good news that Jesus has risen from the dead, can't keep it to ourselves either. We've got to share it with others. Now, we can go and we can preach, we can tell uh, others about it verbally, we can teach about the resurrection, but we can also do it in the way that we live, in the way that we treat one another, in the way that we treat our family and our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers, the way that we care for them, and the way that we give of our time, our energy and our resources, is in the way that we go throughout the world, responding to disasters, and those who are uh, uh, horribly chained to uh, disastrous and evil things. We can share the good news. We can deliver the captives, just as Christ has come and delivered us. Christ in us will do that and more as we go and we share and we tell of the good news of the resurrection. And fourthly, when we recognize that Jesus is back from the dead, we want to live in a way that honors Him and respects Him and shares His commands and His directives uh, for the world and for us. After the women encountered the angel and the empty tomb, they ran to fulfill their, mess, their mission that the angel had given them. But the text says, they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. You ever had that interesting mix of feelings, being afraid and joyful at the same time? I think there's no greater example of that than when two people get married. There's a lot of joy for the moment and a little fear of what lies ahead, isn't there? These women had great joy, but also trembling at the same time for what it might mean for them and for the world. And as they were running to tell the disciples, Jesus interrupted their mission and greeted them, not with the NRS visa version of greeting. I think that's too formal. The Greek here says, hi, hello, yo, it's me, I'm here. Here's my moral greeting that you have heard over and over again. And when they heard him say hello, they recognized his they recognized his mannerisms and instantly they fell at his feet, grabbing his feet, feeling the reality of the warmth of the body, and that it was indeed Jesus Christ. Now, it wasn't a spiritual resurrection at all, but a bodily resurrection. A real, live body rose from the grave. Jesus is indeed alive, and they had that tactile assurance that his body was raised, and that he was back. At this point, Jesus repeated the command of the angel with one little difference. He told them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Here the, the women had the privilege of seeing Christ there in Jerusalem, but the guys were going to have to wait until they got to Galilee. <laughs> You know, I really believe that as men and women are called together to advance the kingdom of God, to be proclaimers and preachers and teachers in the body of Christ, and this is all evidence that leads to that case. The repetition of these imperatives underlined with an explanation mark the meaning in Galilee, but it also communicates something even more important. Jesus called them brothers which communicates love and forgiveness. It's an endearing term. It's a family term. It says, hey, listen, I, I recognize that you guys blew it. 
you denied me, and I'm going to love you anyway. I'm going to forgive you. I accept you. I welcome you, and I'm calling you to come together, to be with me, to meet with me, to learn more, to experience me. Come together and know that I live, and that we have a, a mission to accomplish, work to do. You're to go to Galilee with confidence, with forgiveness, and with hope. A confident hope. A hope that cannot be dashed. The eyewitnesses have seen Jesus, and now it is time for all to experience Him. I love in the movie, when they gathered together and, and broke bread and drank wine, the presence of Christ appeared. I love the fact that in worship we get to experience the living Lord and how they communicated that visually for us in the film clip. The resurrection is a call for us to meet with Jesus. He calls us his family, his beloved. And every week that we gather together in the body of Christ here at Geneva or whatever church we go to, we are gathering with Christ in the midst of us. For he said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of you. We have assurance that Jesus is here right now in our very midst. Resurrection is not the last word of the Gospels. It calls us to go and tell. When the disciples went to Galilee, Jesus did not tell them to gather in a holy huddle, huddle for the rest of their lives. He gave them some assurances. He gave them some commands. And the Great Commission, which Matthew records at the end of his chapter, when he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How could these first disciples not do what Jesus had called them to do? They were compelled to go into the world and to share the good news that He is indeed risen from the grave. The greatest part of the resurrection is that Jesus is with us wherever we are. Wherever he sends us. And he calls us to go and to share that good news. And he empowers us, and here's the best part, with the Holy Spirit. Gifting us with all that we need, all the tools to advance the kingdom of God and to proclaim the good news that he has risen I love the hymn by Bill Gaither and the chorus that goes with it. Perhaps you know it. It's called Because He Lives. And um, sort of a, 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 a moment at the first service where I began to sing it because I just couldn't keep it uh, in, a, in a spoken way. So if you know this, sing it along with me, the chorus of this amazing hymn, which affirms what we believe if Christ is risen from the grave. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth.
But the hope that we have and the assurance that we have is that we will bodily rise from the grave just as Christ has. And this is news that we cannot hold to ourselves. We must live it and speak it and proclaim it to everyone in the world. Let's pray. Lord God, because you live, we can live also. We're so grateful for that wonderful good news. We're so grateful, Lord, for transforming our hearts and minds to receive and believe and to live that which you call us to do and be. We pray, Lord, that you would that we could rededicate our lives to the mission that you've given us to go and to tell, to live knowing that you have indeed risen from the grave and be compelled to the point, Lord, where we can't hold it in. In all that we do, Lord, let us communicate. Help us communicate. You are indeed alive. That you are risen today. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said? Amen. So he is risen.